This is Echo Zoe Radio, episode 84 for April 2015, with Tony Miano on misconceptions about Christianity. Welcome to Echo Zoe Radio, the podcast outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries, where you'll hear about important topics affecting the church today. Our primary goal is to explore a variety of issues while remaining faithful to God and His Word. Stay with us for the next hour as your host, Andy Olson, shares his conversation with this month's guest. Here's your host, Andy Olson. I'm Andy Olson. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. This is episode 84 for April 2015. Tony Miano returns for this episode to talk about common misconceptions that people have about Christianity. Tony's a retired Los Angeles County deputy sheriff and full-time evangelist, now spending his time sharing the gospel with people through one-on-one evangelism, open-air preaching, and equipping other Christians to effectively and biblically share their faith in a dying world. Tony has the perfect guest for this topic because he often encounters all of the misconceptions that we'll talk about for this episode in his day-to-day evangelism work and is well equipped to answer the challenges that people bring with these misconceptions. As usual, you can find show notes for this episode, including an outline of the discussion, a list of scriptures referenced, and additional resources by visiting echozoe.com slash 84. Also a reminder, in case you missed any of the most recent episodes, you can now hear Echo Zoe Radio on TuneIn Radio and Stitcher. Links to both are on the website. As of this recording, they're easy to find on the right side of any page on the site. With that, here's my discussion with Tony Miano. Welcome, Tony. Uh, It's great to have you back on Echo Zoe Radio. Uh, Andy, it's really good to be with you, brother. Glad to be here. I can't believe, you know, I only do... 12 episodes a year. You know, when you do one a month, it works out to 12 a year. Kind of funny how that works. And I can't believe that it's been, I've, I've done a full year's worth of, of podcasting since uh, last time we spoke. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but uh, the older I get, the faster time moves, it seems. Oh, yeah. I noticed that right out of high school. You get out of high school, and of course, I hated high school, but then you get to college, yeah. and you start having some fun, and it, uh, that time that clock ticks way faster once you get out of that. Well, I, I've been out of high school for 33 years, so oh. imagine how fast it's spinning for me. Yeah, I'm coming up on 20. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so our topic, we're uh, it's and we were kind of chatting a little bit beforehand. What brought this about? I'm running a little late this month, and as I mentioned before, uh, the listeners didn't weren't privy to when I have to push a episode back, and I get to be in the second week of the month and I don't have even a guest lined up yet, I start panicking a little bit. And um, so I I took the final exam for my architectural registration exams. Uh, There's seven tests. I took that on April 9th. And uh, so I didn't want to think about anything until I got that test done. And uh, it's done now. And I actually, a week later, I found out I passed. So I'm so happy to be done with that. I've been working on that for six years, seven tests. And uh, now I'm, eager to jump back in and focus on uh, podcasting and talking about the Lord and the gospel and some of those theological issues. And one that you're great with, something you deal with all the time. We're going to talk about misconceptions. And we're going to talk specifically about misconceptions that unbelievers have about Christianity. A lot of that old hat stuff that you hear every day from hecklers and and professing Christians. <laughs> uh, I, you know, you, you sent me a, a, a basic outline, uh, you know, showing showing me some of the topics you would like to cover in the time we have together, and what you've presented to me uh, are are statements, assertions, beliefs, uh, not only from uh, the professed atheist of which doesn't exist, uh, but but many professing Christians uh, will make these arguments when they come across me when I'm preaching in the open air or in one to one conversations. And as we go through some of these, and we probably won't get through all of them because I've got about a dozen different things on there, you're going to have to explain that because that seems sad for the state of the church that, yeah. that professing well, Christians would. You know, I, I, 
uh, Andy, I like to I like to always make a differentiation between American evangelicalism and the church. Uh, the the bride of Christ, as imperfect uh, and yet to be fully sanctified and glorified as she is in her present state, the bride of Christ is beautiful. Uh, the bride of Christ. Uh, does not follow the commands of Jesus perfectly as of yet, but that's that's her desire. She wants to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. She wants to reach the lost with the gospel. She wants to have biblical community among the brethren. Uh, but American evangelicalism, uh, I believe, is a Christless, gospelless, demonic religious system in which the Bride of Christ finds herself in the United States. So when I, when I talk about American evangelicalism, I'm talking about the, the broad brush stroke of those who profess to know Christ within the United States, recognizing that the majority of American evangelicalism is lost, mm-hmm. and the Bride of Christ is a remnant within that system. So you're really talking about what theologians would uh, distinguish between the visible church and the invisible church. Going, yes, going back through the Reformation and yes, yeah. the 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 visible church in the United States is is filled to overflowing with bad teaching, false mm-hmm. converts, false teachers. Um, and the authentic church, the Bride of Christ, which of course is visible, um, is is much smaller than what the visible church presents itself to the world. Mm -hmm. The Bride of Christ is much smaller than any of us realize, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, the first one that I I put on our list is going to be something that you're definitely going to encounter every time you hit the streets. Yes. And that is this misconception that good people can earn their way to heaven. And of course, within that is a kind of a, another misconception that there are good people. Yeah. Let's go right. Let's go right to the word of God. Romans three, Uh, verses uh, 10 through 18 uh, answer this assertion uh, quite emphatically. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. When when, uh, people assert that uh, good people can earn their way to heaven uh, and that there are good people, uh, I quickly counter that with there are no good people in heaven. Um, there and was just water. as there are no proud people in heaven. The reason I can say there are no good people in heaven is because there are no good people. Right. God's standard of goodness is moral perfection. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Uh, that is the only standard of goodness uh, acceptable to God, initiated by God, and it's a standard that none of us can live up to. There are no good people. Amen. And I am wondering, yeah, I didn't know maybe a good place to, to bring this up, but man, not, maybe now is as good a time as any. But as we go through these misconceptions, given your history coming out of Roman Catholicism, I wonder how much of this is ingrained in that Roman, almost cultic system Oh, it, it's it's heavily ingrained. I mean, I you know people laugh when I say this, but I actually believed this as a boy that all Italians are going to heaven. <laughs> uh, my name ends in a vowel, so I figured I was in, and and I was taught early on. I, I was taught to believe uh, many truths about about who Jesus is, that he was born of a virgin, that he was and is the only son of God, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the grave. Mm -hmm. I I believed all those things from my earliest age. But I also believed, and I was taught to believe, that I needed to be a good person, that my good had to outweigh the bad. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, and and Roman Catholicism is just like every other man-made religion, where there's a works righteousness uh, structure 
where you believe a certain set of of spiritual truths or untruths, uh, depending on the religion. But added to that is your own efforts to earn the grace of God, to earn the mercy of God, to earn the forgiveness of God through your good works and and through your good deeds. In fact, in in Romans uh, fourteen, I believe it's the second half of of uh, verse uh, twenty three. I believe um, uh, it, the Word of God tells us that anything we do, if it is not done by faith to bring glory to Christ, it is sin. Mm-hmm. Anything we do. So if if uh, if as a deputy sheriff, I jumped in front. Uh, of another deputy to save his life and took his bullet. If I did that outside of Christ, even that is seen as sin. If I help a little old lady across the street and I don't do it for the glory of Christ or by faith in Christ, God sees that as sin because all of our good works, the prophet Isaiah made clear, are like a filthy rag. And as, as, uh, as detestable as the terminology is, I think it's important for people to know that 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 phrasing that word use in the Hebrew in Isaiah sixty six that is often translated as filthy rag or dirty cloth or dirty rag is in actuality uh, literally a used menstrual cloth, mm-hmm. and anything we do outside of Christ, any good work we do that in which we presume we are earning merit before God. God sees as a used menstrual cloth. That's a vivid mental picture there. Yeah, and 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 yeah, as vivid and as grotesque as that is, and, and how maybe difficult it may be to convey that in in certain settings, you know, with uh, with certain people. Um, I think it's important that God chose to use that kind of descriptive terminology in His Word to make it perfectly clear. That nothing we do in and of ourselves is, is seen as good to God. In fact, it is seen as utterly detestable. Sorry, before I get too distracted here, I'm seeing things pop up all over the place. Let's jump to the next one. Okay. And I know you, you, you see this one all the time, too. And that is that there's this misconception that Jesus isn't the way to heaven. Jesus right. is, is a way to heaven. Yeah, yeah, we could thank people like Oprah Winfrey for uh, perpetuating that falsehood, but many others as well. And I and I get this from professing Christians, Andy, mm. that yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but He's not the only way to heaven. He's the way that I've chosen uh, to get to heaven. Uh, we we can thank uh, people like the the late Robert Schuler, who perpetuated this idea. Uh, and that uh, Jesus is in all religions. He's one of many false teachers who perpetuated this false idea. We, we, as followers of Jesus Christ, we take God at, at his word. And Jesus said in John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. This is why the the uh, ecumenism of today, the idea of tolerance and acceptance of today, can never accept Christianity or Christians, because Christianity and the God of Christianity, who is the only God who uh, sent his son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, speaks entirely of exclusivity. Jesus is exclusive. He is the only way to receive forgiveness of sin. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only way to heaven. There are no others. And it's not any Jesus. I, Andy, one of the things that, that I battle a lot now on the streets, and I'm, I'm constantly reminding other open-air preachers of this, that it's not simply, it's not enough anymore to simply name the name of Jesus. Well, we know there's great power in that name. We know there's no other name uh, given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. But there are so many false representations, so many caricatures of of Jesus in other religions and other forms of thought that it's not enough for us to simply name the name of Jesus. We have to express to people in very certain terms 
which Jesus we represent. Uh, we don't represent the Jesus of Catholicism who continues to suffer and die on the cross through an unbiblical practice known as the Mass. We do not represent the Jesus of Islam that sees him only as a prophet second of Muhammad, when in reality Jesus created Muhammad, and it is before Jesus that Muhammad will one day stand to give an account for his blasphemous religion. We do not represent the Jesus of Mormonism that sees Jesus as one of a billion gods, for Mormon men believe that they one day will be the Lord and Savior of their own domain, of their own world. They also believe that Jesus is a created being and the spirit brother of Lucifer. And, and we don't represent the Jesus of, of the Watchtower Society that also believes that Jesus is a created being and the incarnation of Michael the Archangel. And we don't believe in Oprah's Jesus, which is a, a really cool dude that's one to many way, one of many ways to heaven, and we don't believe in many of the American evangelical representations of Jesus that see him as a homeboy, as an effeminate, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, surfer-looking dude who hangs on the living room wall. Hmm. We, we've got to declare that he is, he is, and was, and always will be the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He is the the only begotten Son of God. He is the line of the tribe of Judah who will judge both the living and the dead. He was with the Father in creation. All things were created by him and through him and for him. Nothing has ever been made that was not made by Jesus Christ. And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, not merely a, a wealthy rancher, but he is sovereign Lord and owner over everything that he has made, including every human being. And he is also the Lord of every man. Uh, a person doesn't make Jesus Lord. He's not elected as Lord. He's not voted in as Lord. He is the Lord of every man, whether a person lives in wanton rebellion against him or is in loving submission to him. Jesus is no less Lord over every human being. You know, and I was going to say too that I think that these these both of these things really go well together or I shouldn't say well they they tend to go together and that is if somebody thinks that good that there are good people and good people can go to heaven it therefore would make sense that Jesus is only one way because in their view all different religious systems are just different ways of being good enough to get into heaven yeah well again it's it's built on a it's built on a number of false premises. Uh, one, that there are good people, which we already discussed. Mm -hmm. There are no good people. That includes, of course, you and me. Right. Um, and, and religions don't make people better. Uh, religion simply makes people a slave to that religion. Man cannot make himself better. Man cannot make himself commendable to God or worthy of his grace. And any effort to do that uh, like building the Tower of Babel is going to be uh, utterly rejected by God. The, salvation is not Jesus plus religion, Jesus plus good works, uh, Jesus plus uh, turning over a new leaf, Jesus plus cleaning up your act. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. What matters to God is not whether or not we make ourselves better people through religious practices, what matters to God is if we will come to him on his terms, for he does not negotiate with sinners. He commands all people everywhere to repent, to repent, and by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. now, some people have this misconception about Jesus that he, today in 2015, is dead somewhere in, in a grave disregarding, uh, you know, most people will, even Catholics and, and uh, professing Christians, you know, we making that distinction that you made before between the bride of Christ and the visible church, will grant the resurrection and they'll grant the ascension, but somehow in their mind they get this idea that somehow Jesus went on to die again and that he's still in the grave. Yeah, that that's, well, uh, and uh, that's utterly untrue. The, the people who saw Jesus, and there were at least 500 people who saw the risen Lord, they did not see an apparition. They did not see merely a spiritual representation. 
They saw him alive and in the flesh, albeit glorified, they saw him alive. They touched him. Mm-hmm. When, when, uh, when Thomas, one of, one of the 11 uh, remaining uh, disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection, when he missed the initial encounter with the risen Lord and, and the other uh, disciples told him about it, he said, look, unless I can put my, my uh, finger in his hands, my finger in his side, I will not believe. Jesus appears uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, the text really doesn't give us the time frame. It could have been immediate. But the, the Lord appears, and, and Thomas immediately drops to his knees and declares, My Lord and my God. He didn't rub his eyes, thinking he had too much mustard on a bad piece of falafel. He saw the risen Lord physically. Uh, Jesus broke bread. Uh, ate fish with the disciples on the beach. Uh, again, uh, the the women who who first saw the risen Lord clung to him, held on to him, touched him, and so Jesus, uh, fully God and fully man and without sin, is fully God and fully man today. He physically, bodily resurrected from the grave and now sits at the right hand of power. Mm-hmm. Well put. There's also this misconception about about Satan as well. People understand, Christian or not, that Satan is is the Lord of evil, the king of darkness. But they somehow get this misconception that because we are in a world where there's a great battle between good and evil, that somehow Satan is on an equal or near equal footing with God and that he actually has a chance in this battle. Yeah, we and we could uh we could thank tongue in cheek. Uh, the Word of Faith movement, uh, the health, wealth, health, wealth, and prosperity movement, um, uh, you know, TBN, uh, Trinity Broadcast Network, uh, people like that, false teachers, uh, who have created this mythology. Uh, I don't even want to call it theology. Right. Created this mythology that Satan kicked God out of Earth, and that unless we invite him in unless we give him permission to by speaking you know positive confessions and words of faith that god is not allowed to operate in this realm because satan is in control that's that's blasphemous and all we have to do is is look at the first couple of chapters of job mm-hmm. uh to see quite clearly that that while while satan is referred to as as the lord of the earth uh, father of lies and many other things. Even Satan is under submission to the sovereign will of God. Satan had to petition God to lay a hand not only on Job's body, but on Job's possessions, on his family. Satan does nothing with without the uh, without the consent, uh, without God allowing it uh, to happen. Um, Satan is Satan is not in control. Uh, he is not he is not the Lord of Hell. Uh, while while Hell was created for Satan and his demons, uh, you know, all those who don't know Christ will spend eternity there. But they won't be there under the sovereign rule of Satan. They will be there under the sovereign rule of God. Satan will just right. be another eternally punished being who rebelled against God in Hell. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't even thought about the the word faith connection there, but it's that's a very important one to make. I mean, you know, we're so accustomed to this in our culture, seeing the cartoons of the guy trying to make a decision, and he's got a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. Yeah. And it gives us this false perception before we become believers that somehow those two, those two beings on our shoulder, if if they were even real, are somehow on equal footing. Yeah, and they're not. Uh, clearly, they're not. And another another false teaching of the Word of Faith movement and the New Apostolic Reformation, Bethel Redding, those folks, is this false notion that that uh, Jesus also had to go to hell for three days uh-huh. to suffer on our behalf, and he had to have some kind of arm wrestling match, you know, a la uh, you know Sylvester Stallone and Over the Top to get back the keys of the kingdom, that, that's all blasphemous heresy as well. Jesus said to Telestai 
on the cross, paid in full. It is finished. He did go to declare victory to the captives uh, before his resurrection. The word of God makes it, makes us clear of that, but not but not to uh, not to win any kind of fight. Everything was defeated on the cross. He was mm-hmm. Satan and sin and death were all defeated on the cross and through the resurrection. He went there to declare victory, not to beg. Uh, for anything that was always his. Right. Well said. Uh, do you encounter this one a lot? I assume you do, but this uh, misunderstanding that, uh, that, that the faith that we have as Christians is somehow necessarily blind. Yes. Yeah. I get that a lot from uh, professing atheists and I always say professing atheists again, because God's word in Romans one makes it clear that there are no atheists, only people who suppress the truth they know about God mm-hmm. by their unrighteousness. Um, but yes, they, they constantly say faith is necessarily blind. And uh, I'll begin in part by, by applying their assertion to their own worldview <laughs> because they, in, they insist that Darwinian evolution is true, something that is not testable, observable, or repeatable. They blindly believe, setting aside their own scientific methodology – and declare that Darwinian evolution is true. It's never been seen, it's never been tested, and it's never been repeated. Um, But yet, so their faith is blind. Our faith, uh, the Christian's faith, is not blind. because, Because the God of all creation, the God who is knowledge, has given mankind the ability to discern right from wrong, the ability to comprehend and understand that God is and the ability to know him for certain. The word of God says in Romans 8 that uh, that we know these things, that the Spirit of God testifies to these things, and that the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that these things are true. John, in, in uh, both his gospel and in and in his first epistle, says that these things have been written so that you may know that you have eternal life. See, the the issue is one of worldview. It's not of evidence. There is a the biblical worldview, uh, the God of the Bible, the God of, of Christianity, and then there is everything else, which is equal to absurdity. The, the unbeliever, the professing unbeliever, the denier of God's existence tries to live in a worldview where they can't account for knowledge, they can't account for wisdom, they can't account for discernment, they can't account for the laws of logic, they can't account for the laws of science, they can't account for any of the natural laws, they believe in things that are immaterial while insisting that they are naturalists living in a material world, mm-hmm. and they have to come into the Christian worldview to... Uh, be able to justify any truth claim they make, anything they believe is true. So no, the Christian does not live with a blind faith. The man who denies God, the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God, lives with a blind faith that it's okay for him to try to live and exist in a worldview of total absurdity. And I look, uh, or I, I, the verse that comes to my mind that, that addresses this as well is, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. That, uh, for by grace we are saved through faith, and right, that not yeah. of ourselves. It's, it's, the, it's gift the gift of, of God, God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. Exactly. That, and this being a gift from God, referring to not just the grace, but the faith as well. Yes. That when we have that faith, it's not a blind faith, it's a faith that's given to us by, right. by God himself. Amen. And, well, and in fact, you know, James 1 makes it clear that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no changing or, or, or shifting of shadows. Uh, everything we have uh, from, from the air we breathe to the ability to breathe it uh, is, is a gift from God. There are no mm-hmm. random particles, neurons, neurotransmitters, atoms, molecules. There's nothing random, all created in order for the glory of God, and he allows us uh, to be observers, to experience his creation, to experience the reality of his existence, and for some, he allows to enjoy a perfect, uh, reconciled 
uh, relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm Mm-hmm. So you're up on the box and you're preaching the gospel to whoever is within earshot and will listen to you and even those who won't listen to you. Mm-hmm. And you get some some people that are you know, maybe not totally hostile, but it, it, they just want to make sure you got things right. And someone walks up to you and says, hey, man, you're not supposed to judge. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then I, and then I quickly come back with, well, then why are you judging me? <laughs> That's not um, you fair. tell me I'm not supposed to judge, and you've just made a judgment of me, um, suggesting that I'm judging others. Wait, that's logic. So do you Don't see, go there. Do you see the hypocrisy in your own statement? You tell me that the Bible instructs people not to judge, while you violate what you believe the Bible says by judging me for what you perceive to be the judging of others. Mm-hmm. But John 7.24 says that we are not to judge by appearances, but we are to judge with righteous judgment. Every human being who has been given a conscience by God, who has the law of God written on their hearts by God, makes judgments every day of their life. They, uh, out here in Southern California, we've got Board of Health letters on restaurants, A, B, C, D, um, you know, A being you know uh, the highest standard. We presume if the inspector wasn't bought off by the restaurant owner, uh, you know, down to uh, you know nasty hole in the walls where the cockroaches are waiting in line to get in. <laughs> and and you're standing in front of two restaurants and you see an A on one door and a C on the other. You're going to judge that C restaurant as not being worthy of your business, mm-hmm. and you're going to go to the A restaurant. Mm-hmm. Right? We judge. We judge all the time. We see a suspicious character walking toward us regardless of race, and we're nervous. We begin to check for our purse or our wallet. We hold the purse tighter. We put the wallet in our front pocket. We might cross the street. We make judgments all the time. You mean to tell me that when uh, the unbeliever reads the newspaper and sees the story of a pedophile who had been arrested for victimizing small children. You mean to tell me that unbeliever doesn't make a judgment about that pedophile? Of course he does. Mm-hmm. And, and if he says he doesn't, then are you going to invite the pedophile to babysit your kids, Mr. Nonjudgmental? Why not? You shouldn't judge him. We all make judgments because the God who created us, in whose image we were created, is a judge. Now, many, you know, many people say, "Judge, you know, judge not, lest you be, lest you be judged." Right? Everybody yep. knows Matthew seven one. Yep. Right, but no one knows John seven twenty four. Everyone knows Matthew seven one, and and I repeat back to them what what I heard Paul Washer say: "Twist not Scripture, lest you be like <laughs> Satan." Matthew Matthew seven one makes it clear that if I'm looking at pornography. I ought not be pointing or wagging a finger at another man saying it's wrong for you to be looking at pornography. Mm-hmm. If I'm out getting drunk, I shouldn't be wagging my finger uh, at a professing Christian who who I see staggering out of a bar, right? Uh, I, that's what it means to uh, remove the log from our own eye before we worry about the splinter in someone else's. Mm-hmm. But we most certainly are to judge. We're to judge with right judgment. Uh, uh, scripture makes us makes that very clear. And anyone t- who tells me it's wrong for me to judge people is being a hypocrite by judging me for judging people. Right. Yeah. Now we're going to get into some of those people will think that there are contradictions in the Bible. They'll bring up things like slavery and treatment of women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, How when do you I... deal with that when someone comes and says, "Well, what about slavery and what about women?" You know, this is a, yeah. a misconception that that because there are Slaves in the Bible, mm-hmm. that therefore the Bible condones slavery, and because in our own country, in our own history of slavery, slave owners used some of those passages to justify their slave ownership, how do we address this misconception that that slavery is somehow not the wicked evil that it really is? Right. Um, one of the first things I do when when someone when when someone comes up to me. Um, and asks a question, they do it one of two ways. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll either say, 
you know, it, it, it seems to me like the Bible condones slavery. Can you explain that to me? Mm-hmm. Or they'll say, hey, your Bible, your holy book says slavery is good. What do you say about that? Mm-hmm. Well, the first guy is probably looking for an answer to his question. And that's the why sec- I want to address the second. The we're... second guy is merely trying to justify his unbelief yep. at my expense. Yep. So with the second guy, I would say, I would ask, why is slavery wrong? And immediately, and immediately level an assault against his worldview. He is making, he is making a moral assertion a that judgment? slavery is wrong. Uh, he's making a judgment? How- I'm sorry? He's making a judgment? He's making a judgment. Yeah, yeah he, he's asserting morality. He's, he's making a truth claim. He, he's asserting that there is right and there is wrong. And I immediately ask him, how does he account for that? Mm-hmm. Why is slavery wrong? And they'll, you know, they'll either argue, you know, well, to me it's wrong. Well, okay, your, your opinion is arbitrary and non-binding. I don't have to live by your opinion. Well, society says it's wrong. No, that's not true. Uh, there are many societies that condone slavery. Um, what makes the society that doesn't condone slavery better than the society that does uh, based on your worldview? And basically what that shows them, what I bring them to is the reality that, that they are making moral assertions because they were created by a moral lawgiver who has written morality on their heart. Yeah. So, so I deal with that. Um, I deal with that worldview dysfunction of theirs first. And but, then but what about the it, guy with going back to that first guy who was the just, first guy? Yeah. yeah. There's, um, there, God makes, made allowances for, for slavery, um, in, uh, in the conquest of, of, uh, land, uh, through warfare, but there were also specific laws given to the Jewish people for how slaves were to be treated. Not only that, but slavery, uh, particularly in the Old Testament times, slavery was a form of judicial punishment. It was akin to indentured servitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you steal from somebody, you go into debt, and you can't pay your debt. You're indentured. To the person to whom you owe, you become their slave. But in but even outside of Jewish culture, um, uh, back in New Testament times, for you to insult a slave was to slap the face of the slave owner. For you to mistreat a slave was to mistreat the slave owner. Many slaves, uh, especially in the Greco-Roman culture, lived better than free people because of who their masters were. And uh, according to Jewish law, uh, a slave, uh, I believe it was after seven years, was, was uh, given his freedom. There, there were some conditions to that, but he was given his freedom. And then it was the option of the slave whether or not he stayed or left. And if he decided to stay, they would they would put his earlobe against uh, uh, against the doorpost and pierce it with an awl, indicating that this person was now volitionally, voluntarily committing himself to serve his master for the rest of his life. What we don't see in Scripture is the slavery we saw in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries of Europe and uh and America where where people were were subjugated, beaten, uh uh mistreated, uh raped, used, abused, maligned, counted as three fifths of a person because of the color of their skin. Uh the, the Bible doesn't know anything of the slavery uh, uh Western Europe and the United States experienced two, three hundred years ago. Right. Well said. Thank you. Another one, this one we see a lot, especially in the media. We see, we get people who will think, you know, if you're a Christian and you believe the Bible and you live by what you believe in the Bible, you believe it so much that you're going to live it out. You are a Christian fundamentalist. And fundamentalism 
course, is always equal in their eyes, whether you're a Christian fundamentalist or a Muslim fundamentalist. And so because fundamentalist Islam can be a very violent religion, they just say, well, because fundamentalism is fundamentalism, you Christians must be violent people too. Mm. Yeah, that that is uh, very easy to dismantle, to dismantle, very easy to disarm. The Christian fundamentalist, uh, and of course, you know, you and I both know that different people define that term fundamentalism in different ways. Right. But in but in the context of this present assertion, uh, this present conversation, the Christian fundamentalist is one who loves his neighbor. The Islamic fundamentalist is one who will kill him. So they are, they are mutually exclusive. Christian fundamentalism and Islamic fundamentalism are mutually exclusive. The Christian fundamentalist believes the Bible. The Islamic fundamentalist believes the Quran, and they say opposite things about who God is, who Jesus is, how we are to treat our fellow man, how we can have sin forgiven, how we can receive eternal life. They are mutually exclusive beliefs. It is the false convert to Islam, many of whom live here in the West, that believe that Islam is a religion of peace. They do not believe their own scriptures. Just as the Christian who says there's many ways to God, that Jesus uh, isn't the only way, that if you go to a movie, you're in sin, that if you're a woman wearing pants, you're in sin, those are false converts who don't believe the, the Christian scriptures. Mm-hmm. So you, you can't equate Christian fundamentalism with Islamic fundamentalism. And then if the person says, well, what about Westboro Baptist? Well, there's nothing Christian about Westboro Baptist. What, what, about, what about the Crusades? Well, those were predominantly a Roman Catholic run uh, industry uh, going out and, and killing people because they don't believe as you believe is sin in God's eyes, regardless of, of what brand or, or color of fundamentalism you want to paint it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of rabbit trails I could go down on that one, but uh, I think you're sure. well said, I, I guess. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm thinking we're getting through these faster than I thought we would. Well, we could talk about other stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, we sure can. So, go, let's, so let's go down a couple of those rabbit trails that, that well, came to mind. Well, um, let's talk about the, the Crusades. I think okay. there's a lot of misconceptions around the Crusades as well, and that you were correct when you said they were predominantly Roman Catholic endeavors. but that they were conquests, it's not, not quite as much, not what people think. You know, a lot of the Crusades set out to go and, and liberate Jerusalem so that pilgrims could, could go make their pilgrimages to Jerusalem. But for the most part, mo- most of the Crusades didn't even make it to Jerusalem. They were too busy conquering right. other professed Christians along the way. Yes, that, yeah, that's true. And, and many, many of the, the, the conquest battles we know were, uh, were responses to the tyranny of Islam mm-hmm. uh, as, as well. Um, you know, and I guess we can get into the whole conversation of what is a just war, what is not a just war. Um, you know, but the, the bottom line is that scripture makes it, scripture makes it abundantly clear that that no one comes to faith in Christ by the sword. Right. Islam, on the other hand, teaches that that people will come to Islam by the sword, or they will be die, or or they'll die. That, that's one of the things that troubles me with with some uh, eschatological movements uh, today, even within Christianity. Yeah. Uh, because I, I think about what what could possibly be the end game. Uh, if if these philosophies are actually lived out, and I can't help but to see a profession of faith in Christ as a way of avoiding the death penalty, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, in, in a in a theocratic type of of government government setup, and you know, I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit trail. And I'm not I'm not nearly as well educated on eschatology as I should be, but but any anything any philosophy any theological construct that in any way could lead to conversion by the sword is not christian so if during the if during the crusades people were 
people were making professions of faith in Christ because it was better to do that than get their head lopped off. They weren't coming to faith in Christ, and the people who were demanding that in all likelihood were not Christians. Right. Well, that's a good misconception that wasn't on the list. No, oh, there you go. <laughs> the, um, the whole eschatology thing, too, I think, you know, this, this idea, I would put that as a misconception. I think there are people who legit, you know, I talked about this last month with J.D. Hall and the month before with our Scott Clark on theonomy and federal both vision. smarter there's, men than me. Well, there's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> smarter men than both of us. A, a lot of those two views are, are tied heavily to post-millennialism. And, you know, I, I, I think J.D. Hall last month was very charitable and, and I would stand with his charity in saying that, that while we don't agree with post-millennialism, we wouldn't call post-millennialists uh, false teachers per se. But uh, a lot of those or false problems, converts, cross converts as well. But a lot of those uh, really bad eschatological views kind of flow out of, not necessarily are part of, but flow out of your post millennialism, your dominionism, yeah. and whatnot. And 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 really, and, you know, Andy, and uh, it, it, what concerns me, what concerns me most, I think, about the most popular cage stage of the moment which is an eschatological cage stage. You know, there, there's been the, the Calvinist cage stage. There's been the biblical evangelism cage stage. There's been the ecclesi- ecclesiological cage stage. And there, I'm sure there's probably been others. Mm-hmm. But what concerns me about any person locked in that cage stage is not so much the theology they're adhering to or promoting, unless, of course, it is flat-out damnable heresy. Well, then, of course, it's a concern. Yeah. Um, but what concerns me more, I, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm concerned about some people locked in this eschatological cage stage, not because of what they believe, but because of how they're treating other brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, you you, you I, can't hate other Christians and and see that as being consistent with someone who is actually born again. I'm glad you said that because I think. And I'm glad you put that in the context of, of cage stage and, and whatnot, because that seems to be a problem that is easy to fall into. Yeah. And that you get so I've, wedded I've fallen to into many. You, you get so <laughs> wedded to your theology and you might be right even in your theology and right. the people you're disagreeing with might be wrong. But uh you do more damage by by beating each other over the head with it than you do just working it out and let letting iron sharpen iron. Yeah. And yeah. uh it's... And, and, and at the same time, I, I know I know uh, a number of postmillennialists, a number of theonomists, uh, who are are my dear friends, my dear brothers, who aren't locked in a cage stage. I mm-hmm. I firmly disagree with their position, but I love them, and I can minister alongside them, and they could share my box, mm-hmm. you know, and we can have great fellowship together because I don't hate them, and they don't hate me. You know, and, and I could hear that in our, brothers in, Christ. in our discussion t- uh, today, I could hear that as well, because uh, you were saying a lot of the same things that one of those gentlemen is known for saying in, in, in flushing out problematic worldviews. Um, yeah. This, this particular yeah, brother. And, he, and, and I consider him one of my best friends. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know him very I, I well, him, but I, I love the guy. I him every chance I get yeah. because, because I've, I've been with him. I, I, I've seen his heart. I, I've seen his tears. Uh, for both the saved and the lost, uh, I don't have a question in my mind about the authenticity of his faith. Mm-hmm. I disagree with him in this theological position. And it's it's great when we can, as brothers, uh, recognize that the disagreement isn't enough to knock each other out of fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, uh, you know, a, a misconception that, that non-believers have about Christians is that we are expected by God and by each other to be perfect in every way, shape, and form. Yeah, sadly, um, uh, this is, at least in in the context of my own life, this is seen predominantly, tragically, in open-air preachers. Um, not biblical open-air preachers, mm-hmm. but those who uh, went from us but were never of us. Uh, Pelagians, um, sinless perfectionists, um, open theists, uh, you know, your, your brother Jed's of the world and, and other people like that who, who, 
who are arrogant, arrogant enough to actually assert publicly that it's been many years since they've sinned. Um, and so, and, so when you have people like that, predominantly on college campuses, who assert that not only are we to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, but I am perfect as my Heavenly Father is perfect, it's no wonder that the misconception is out there, that Christians are expected to be perfect in every way. God says that we are to be holy as he is holy. God, God's word, uh, um, it, oftentimes people will, uh, uh, will cite Romans 8, you know, 828, uh, for God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purposes. Um, you know, sadly, Christians often make that a cliche. They'll say that at the wrong time while they're holding someone's hand who just lost a child or a loved one. Hey, God's going to cause all this to work together for good to those who love him. You know, I mean, you, 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 I mean, it's just like fingers on the chalkboard. <laughs> you know, and certainly while there's truth in that, the good that God is going to cause is found in verse 29. And that talks about being conformed to the image of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, sanctification, uh, as, as you know, is a process. Um, it, it begins at conversion. Uh, it continues until we are glorified, until we are translated, until we are brought immediately into the presence of our Lord and Savior. And, and I like the way Paul Washer describes it. He describes it as a staircase where a, a Christian takes four steps forward, maybe one step back, three steps forward, two steps back, five steps forward, three steps back. It, it, it's an overall progression towards Christ's likeness, but it's not a straight line rocket ship to the moon. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, even though even though we've been given a new nature, even though the Spirit of God dwells within us, there is still a war going on inside of us, a war between the Spirit and the flesh. Now, I don't know where, where you are theologically with Romans 7. I know there's a few different views. I believe Paul is, is describing himself uh, in Romans chapter 7, uh, describing himself as a follower of Jesus Christ who is waging a war um, against sin. Mm-hmm. And so... Yes, Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Um, and the reality of that is, is that uh, this side of heaven, we won't be there because we're still living in this fallen flesh, because there's still a war raging in us. The, the, people, the people I am concerned for are the people who have no war going on inside of them because they don't believe they need Christ or who believe there's no war going on inside of them because they believe they've arrived and, and they've, and they've uh, reached this level of, of sinless perfection. Yeah. Uh, the, the Christian is called to hate his own sin, to mortify his flesh. Uh, a, a, Christian, uh, a Christian doesn't, uh, doesn't dive into, uh, dive into a, a mud hole and wallow in it like a pig. If he falls in it, he's doing everything he can to climb back out. And again, I, I keep citing Paul Washer. I, I want to give credit where credit's due. I think he used this analogy as well. You, you have a pig setting, sitting at a banquet table, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe even a heavenly banquet table, if we can even imagine that. And there's this pig who by its very nature is a pig. Next to the pig's seat is a bucket of stinky, slimy, rotten slop. The pig looks at the banquet table, and he looks at the bucket of slop, and by nature, he dives into the slop. That's where he wants to be. That's what he loves. In an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, God changes the nature of that pig into a man. That man, realizing where he's at, is now vomiting the slop, can't wait to clean off his face, can't wait to get to the banquet table. Now, if he's sitting at the banquet table and something happens, a Southern California earthquake, he's knocked out of that, out of that seat, he falls into the slop, he's not going to sit there and reminisce about how much he loved being in the slop and deciding to stay there. He's going to try to get out of it as fast as he possibly can because he's been given a new nature. Mm-hmm. He no longer wants the slop. 
He wants the banquet table. He no longer wants his sin. He wants Christ. And I was going to go to First John uh, on this one, oh, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, First John 1, and I'm going to quote chap, uh, verses 8 through 10. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Yeah, I, I, and and as the and, and that's and written that, to believers. As that, that's... as that thought progresses through First John, some of the sinless perfectionists, the the uh, uh, the Pelagians, will uh, will read from the text uh, those passages where it says, "If you sin, uh, then you have no part of him." Uh, but in the Greek. Uh, the construction of the Greek, a better rendering of those passages is the one who practices sin mm-hmm. uh, is the one who is not truly in Christ. Similar to what we see in Hebrews 10, 26 to 31, 26 in, uh, specifically, if we go, if we practice sin, if we go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains an expectation uh, of forgiveness, but a terrible expectation of judgment. In, in other words, if we profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, but yet we love our sin as much as we ever did, and and we love our sin more than we love Christ, then there's no reason whatsoever for that person to believe that they are in Christ. They should examine themselves, test themselves to see if they are even in the faith. Yep. And a close cousin to this one is that the only people who can come to Christ are those who have already gotten their lives straightened out. Yeah, yeah, I I, I hear that I hear that a lot. You know, I'll share the gospel with someone; they seem to understand. Um, they they seem to be open to the truths of Scripture. There there's uh, uh, some humility. I'm seeing some humility in them. Yep. And, and then I ask them, "All right, so so what are you going to do?" Um, is there any sin in your life that you love so much that you're willing to die and go to hell so that you can enjoy that sin in this life? Is there any reason why you wouldn't turn from your sin and put your trust in Christ? And sometimes people will say, well, no. Okay, then then get right with God. He said, well, you know what? I'm working on that. I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to stop smoking marijuana. I'm going to stop cheating on my wife. I'm going to this, that, or the other thing. And I have to start all over again <laughs> with them. He said, look, uh, you're not going to be able to make yourself clean enough to be acceptable to God. That's moralism. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what American evangelicalism is teaching. There is so much of American evangelicalism that has never completely left Rome, so to speak. Yeah. You know, five ways to a better marriage, six ways to ha- get your kids off drugs, seven ways to be a better employee. It's all works righteousness. Yeah. You're, you're telling primarily unconverted people how to be more moral so that they can have a better life and be more acceptable to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there is nothing, there's absolutely nothing a person can do to make themselves right, ready, or worthy for salvation. This last weekend, um, I was visiting family, and I had a five-hour gospel conversation with this family member, uh, which in and of itself was just a great answer uh, to prayer. And for this family member who was hearing, seemingly believing, understanding, their big hang-up was, you know, well, what more do I need to do? You know, I'm trying to be worthy. I want to be worthy. And, and I looked this person in the eye and said, you're not worthy. You will never be worthy. And you have to do away with your pride that leads you to believe you can be or you need to be. Um, there, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. That is the beauty. That is the beauty of the gospel. Mm-hmm. That there is nothing we can do to make ourselves commendable to God. That He saves us. He saves a person not because of who we are or who we've become. He saves us in spite of who we are, in spite of who we've become. That makes the grace of God and the love of God glorious. The, the reality that there's nothing we could do to earn it. Amen. Well said. And 
just thinking about the years worth of prayer that had to go into that conversation before you got to that. Yeah, and you know what? And, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, about this um, uh, on my radio show this weekend. Mm-hmm. That it it's not too late to try to reboot a relationship that has been destroyed either through either through the denial of Christ by one person or unloving and uncharitable ways of presenting Christ to that person. I mean, uh, with, with this relationship I'm referring to, and I, I shared with you a little bit about it, um, I made so many mistakes with this loved one. I, I was in the bull in a china shop phase mm-hmm. uh, of my faith in Christ. I knew I was saved. I knew Jesus saved me. I knew everyone else needed to be saved. I knew everyone should believe in me, but I didn't really have a clue as to what any of that meant. And then I I just ran roughshod over people's lives. And uh, by God's grace, decades later, he allows me to have the best conversation with this family member regarding spiritual things, regarding the gospel, regarding repentance and faith that I've ever, ever had. And he's allowed me to literally reboot that relationship through the gospel. Not by setting the gospel aside for the sake of the relationship, Mm -hmm. but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it gives me chills just thinking about it. Well, praise God. It's it's wonderful to see that kind of answer to prayer. Amen. And it's not that you said that you've been praying, but I mean, obviously you have. I mean, to have that kind of thing happen, it's just... It's got to be a wonderful experience to come out of that, knowing... It is. And and it fills me me with so much hope. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Um, the, the family members I got to share the gospel with this, this last weekend, um, you know, both would, both would assert that they believe, um, I think both would readily admit that they have no assurance of their salvation, but, but today talking to you, I have a level of hope, um, about what the Lord may do in their lives that if we had talked last week, I would not have had. Well, praise God, and I will be praying. I know many listening will as well. It's um, it's it's great to see the fruits of such prayers. Amen. If you don't mind my asking, are, are these family members? Uh, you know, you came out of Catholicism. Are they yeah. still in it? Uh, no, no, neither one of them are still in it. Um, both um, for many years believe they were in it. Okay. Uh, even though they weren't practicing, I mean that was the same for me when uh-huh. uh, you know I moved to California when I was ten. And moving from Pennsylvania to California, that was the last time, the last time I ever stepped into a Catholic church, unless it was for a funeral or a wedding, was uh, when I was, you know, nine, ten years old. But yet for years and years, I held on to the belief that I was a good Catholic. I was a, I was a, I was an ethnic Catholic. I was, uh, you know, a, a social Catholic, but I wasn't even practicing the Catholic religion. Sure. And, and the same would be true with, with many of my family members. Uh, on, on both sides of our family, Mar- Maria, my wife, her side of the family is predominantly Methodist, uh, but many of the people on her side of the family are two-day-a-year Methodists, you know, uh, Easter and Christmas, uh-huh. um, but would still very much hold on to the fact that they are good Methodists, that they are followers of Jesus Christ. Um, but yet, uh, well, that just goes right back to those early misconceptions that we had yeah. talked about. You know, just thinking that we can be good people, and along with being this misconception that good people get to heaven is this kind of God create uh, God grades on a curve kind of thing, where if you can mm-hmm. point your finger at somebody who does things worse than you do, you sh- should be okay because between, yeah. between the two of you, you know, you're the shoe in. Well, I I like to tell I like to tell people like that. You know, if you had come up to me and said that, I, I would say, Andy, you need to understand that there are nicer people than you and me in hell today. Mm-hmm. There are people who are way nicer than you and me, people who have been more benevolent, people uh, who have given more to the poor, people who have done more for society, people who have done more to better the lives of other people than you and me who are in hell today because God does not grade on a curve. He's he's not arbitrary. The word of God says that God will not be bribed, God will not be mocked. He is not like a corrupt judge 
in a human courtroom. I mean, imagine if, if I were if I were convicted for some kind of crime and it was the day of sentencing and I walked into the courtroom and the judge says, hey, Tony, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, Your Honor, um, I want to let you know that I, I washed the windows on your Mercedes on the way into the courtroom and here's 20 bucks. I think we should forget the whole thing. What do you say? Oh. I'm, I'm going to go to prison for a longer period of time and the second crime – in all likelihood, was worse than the first that got me to stand in front of the judge. You know, I, I could have been in there for a petty theft, looking at 30 days in the county jail, and now I just tried to bribe the judge, and I'm going to prison for years. God will not be bribed. God does not grade on a curve. God does not judge a person based on the color of their skin, does not judge the person based on where they were born, how they were raised, how much money is in their wallet, how little money is in their wallet, how much they put in the plate on Sunday, how many good things they do, how many you – know, God does not judge that way. He's not arbitrary. God is good. He judges everybody uh, against the same perfect moral standard, his – law mm -hmm. you know if you and i if you and i got popped for robbing a uh i don't know do you have Seven Elevens in minnesota we don't i think the nearest one is in madison wisconsin okay so let's say you really had a burr under your saddle to go rob the Seven Eleven in madison wisconsin <laughs> and i happen to be visiting you and you convince me that we ought to we ought to go do this together and uh and so we make the drive all the way into madison wisconsin three and a half hours and yep. Uh, what's that? Three and a half hour drive. Three and a half hour drive. I mean, this just goes to show that criminals are job security <laughs> uh, to law enforcement because you don't have to be a road scholar to be a bad guy. Uh huh. All right. So you and I get this bright idea to drive three and a half hours one way to Madison, Madison Wisconsin, to uh, to rob the Seven Eleven. We pull it off. We're not very good at it. We get caught. We're standing before the judge. We admit – we've already admitted to the crime. The evidence is there. He has found us guilty, and the judge says, Tony, I sentence you to life in prison because you can no longer grow hair and all of your children are adults. Andy, I'm going to let you go because you still have some hair on your head and your children are young. Would that be justice? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and we would think it ridiculous for any human judge to judge arbitrarily that way. Yet human beings believe that God is arbitrary in his judgment. Mm -hmm. And and we always find we always find someone else's sin worse than ours. I, I tell people God is not only going to rid the world of the sin we hate. But he's also going to rid the world of the sin we love. Yeah. And he's going to start with us. And here's a, another little rabbit trail uh, that, that kind of goes along those lines. I'm convinced that there are certain sins in our world today that even if people don't commit them, they, they go along with them. Oh, and yeah. They consider them to be not so bad. And I think that spiritually they do so. Because they figure if I've got to an answer to God someday, I can point to that guy and say, well, that sin was worse than mine. Yeah. You know, and that immediately takes me uh, to Romans one thirty two, Andy. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, the... Yeah, people today they um, they 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 condone all kinds of things. Uh, they they condone the things that God hates. They hate the things that God hates, uh, or they love the things that God hates. They hate the things that God loves. They're they're arbitrary in their judgment as to what is right, what is wrong, what is good, um, what is evil, and uh, and and the hypocrisy of that way of thinking is it should be so obvious. But but people are utterly blinded by their sin, by their um, by their hate of God, um, and and you had made. I'm trying to remember what you said. You had made a point. Can you repeat what you just said, or in part? Or oh, that, that that people, even though they don't practice these sins, that they they go along with them and they encourage them because they figure that that the when they if they uh, ever yes. have to stand before God, they can point to that guy and say, "Well, his sin was worse than mine." Yeah, and here and 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 here's where I go with with that kind of thinking. Uh, many people believe um, that 
the day of judgment is a court trial. Mm -hmm. They believe that they're going to stand before God. They're going to be able to present evidence of their own perceived goodness. They're going to lay before God what they believe are good works. What you and I have already discussed are like a filthy menstrual cloth to God. Filthy rags. Oh, my wife just cringed. Uh, <laughs> honey, that's, that's actually what it means in the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. I guess I've never shared that with her. Um, <laughs> but um, people believe that they're going to that they're going to lay out their body of work, uh, and the good's going to outweigh the bad, and that they're going to be able to call witnesses to testify to their own goodness. What they don't realize is that the day of judgment is not a court trial; it's a day of sentencing. For if one does not love the Son of God, if one does not obey Jesus Christ, the wrath of God already abides on them. They've already been judged. They're on God's death row, simply awaiting the sentence to be carried out. There won't be a word spoken by them on the day of judgment. They will simply have meted out to them the sentence they deserve for their sins against God. And I... and. One of the objections, you know, uh, here's another objection I often hear is that, you know, if God, if God existed, if God was good, he would rid the world of evil, mm -hmm. right? As if the, the presence of evil somehow is evidence against the existence of the one they accuse of causing the evil. I mean, that's, that's how people think mm -hmm. in, in an absurd, godless worldview, utterly irrational. But what I'll do is I'll look at my, I'll look at my watch and, you know, let's say, well, right now, according to my computer, it's 436. So I'll tell the people in the crowd the time. And I'll say, if you want God to rid the world of evil, and he answers that request at 437, where will you be? Because yes, God's going to rid the world of the pedophile who you hate. God's going to rid the world of the, the rapist who you hate. God's going to rid the world of the mass murderer, the, the college campus murderer who you hate. God's going to rid the world of the white-collar criminal who stole all your savings who you hate. Yes, God's going to rid the world of that evil, but he's not going to stop there. He's going to rid the world of every liar, of every thief of every blasphemer, of every adulterer, not only in body but in thought, of every person who's not satisfied with what God has given them. He's going to rid the world of all evil. So where does that put you now that it's 437? Uh. But even for you, there's hope because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God the Father made him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf so that through him we might become, we might receive the righteousness of God. As my, my pastor John MacArthur puts it, on that great and terrible day when God poured out his wrath against sin upon his Son as he shed his innocent blood on the cross, he looked upon his Son as if he had lived our filthy, sin-stained lives. And in exchange for those who by faith repent and believe the gospel, he looks upon them as if they had lived his son's perfect, precious, and priceless life. And as Titus 3 tells us, he saves us not on the basis of anything we have done in righteousness, but based entirely on God's mercy. Wow, wonderful way to close. Thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, you know, we thank spent you. A lot of time talking about the misconceptions, and I'm glad that you wrapped it up by giving the the, the good news of the gospel there. Amen. Well, it's it's been a pleasure being with you as always, brother. And um, I, I I love your podcast. I, I love the ministry God has given you, and I'm grateful to call you friend. Well, thank you. I uh, that's a mutual feeling. And um, you you mentioned uh, your upcoming show. I'm doubting that. First of all, that I'll have this up in time. If even if it is. People probably won't be able to listen to this and in, sure. in time listen to your show, but but yours is weekly. So can you share you know a little bit about your your radio show? Yeah, it's a it's a, a live broadcast on uh, Blog Talk Radio. Mm -hmm. It's called Cross Encounters Radio. Uh, you can uh, find links to that uh, on my website at Cross Encounters Min M I N uh, dot com. Um, if you search iTunes for Cross Encounters Radio. Um, all the shows are podcasted immediately following the broadcast. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be able to find not only the one I referenced, 
uh, but any of the other shows we've done over the last uh, two and a half years. And you do that with a couple of other brothers in Christ? Yeah, with uh, Rich, Rich Story out of uh, Matheston, uh, Mississippi, and Chris Honholtz uh, out of Sparks, Nevada, two very good friends. Yeah, it's a good show. I, I love the camaraderie you guys have together, and I encourage people to, to tune in. Uh, I usually catch it as a podcast. A little yeah, bit and, and if they wanted to listen to it live, it, it airs uh, uh, Saturday afternoons, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, depending on our content, we'll go anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes to two hours, okay. depending on what's on our mind. And that's 4 p.m. Pacific? 4 p.m. Pacific time. Yes, okay. sir. Well, thanks so much, Tony. It, yeah, like, thank it, you, It brother. is a pleasure to, just to talk to you again. I can't believe it's been a year since we've done one together, but uh, it's good. glad to have you back. <laughs> oh, thanks, brother. Good talking to you. Echo Zoe Radio is an outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries. If you are blessed by the show, please consider offering your support. There are many things you can do to help, including prayer, sharing the show with others, and your financial support. Echo Zori Ministries is a registered nonprofit organization with 501c3 tax-exempt status, and your donations are tax-deductible. For more information about how you can support Echo Zoe Ministries, please visit echozoe.com slash support. That wraps up Episode 84. Thanks for listening to Echo Zoe Radio. For show notes, visit echozoe.com slash 84. Don't forget to follow Echo Zoe on Twitter. It's at Echo Zoe. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Echo Zoe Ministries. You can also add Echo Zoe to your Google Plus circles by going to plus Echo Zoe. As we close this episode, we're also closing out the seventh full year of podcasts here at Echo Zoe. As is my custom for the end of the podcasting year, I want to thank those who made the past year another blessed one for me and the podcast. Thank you to Fred Butler, Bob DeWay for two episodes, Richard Bennett, Ryan Habana, Cameron Butel, Nick Coldajelli, Dan Phillips, Justin Peters, Scott Clark, Jordan Hall, and Tony Miano. In addition to those 11 men, I'm greatly thankful for those of you who deliberately make the effort to download the podcast each month and listen. I thank my wife and family for the time and energy that they give and that allows me to do the show every month. And I thank the Lord for his rich blessings that allow me to be in his service through Echo Zoe Ministries. Lord willing, I'll be back next month for the May 2015 episode and the start of the eighth year of Echo Zoe Radio. 